Okay, here we are. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to give this a shot. One way or another, we will all make it out of this room. I promise. All right. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone on video. I'm going to be getting very close to you here. <laughs> um, okay. Where we left off in class was talking about the motet, right? The motet, why is the motet important? The motet is important for a couple reasons. One reason is that once it gets past the discant clausula stage, right around 1300, okay? Once it gets past the discant clausula uh, stage, it becomes a very important um, new medium for composers to just express themselves. Okay, they get to create new music. Again, remember, if we're dealing mostly with chant, and we're dealing with a couple ways to add to chant, uh, the motet comes now as kind of a breath of fresh air for composers. They can now add texts, they can create new polyphonic relationships, they start, um, they start playing with intertextual references in these motets, okay? They really get to kind of explode with creativity, okay? And so the motet is the home in the, from 1300 on, so the 13 to 1400, that would be the 14th century. In the 14th century, the motet is a central genre for composers to express their intellectual capabilities, okay? And in the motet, we see reflected this aesthetic of high intellectualism, all right? Okay, so that's a recap of where we've been. Um, now, with the motet, what we'll see is a continuing complexity. And one of the ways that this complexity is uh, worked out is with what's called the iso, what's called isorhythm. Okay. By the way, all of these um, powerpoints are already, or they should already be on Moodle, so you can you don't have to write all this stuff down. Um, what is isorhythm? Isorhythm basically refers to a way to deal with the chant line in a motet, okay? So if you remember, in a motet, the chant line is always in the bottom, right? And what happens is, uh, maybe if you're not doing a discant clausula anymore, maybe you want the, the piece to extend beyond one time through, right? Beyond one time through the chant line. So what do you do? The easiest thing to do would be to what? Just repeat it, right? So this would be a very simple uh, example of an isorhythmic motet. That is, you have one the like, chant line and then it's repeated. But that's way too simple, right? If the aesthetic is kind of intellectual complexity, maybe this first section is three times as long as the chant line was. Okay, that is. If it's on, at one subdivision, you choose a subdivision that's proportionally three times as long, and then every note get, is three times as long as the original motet. But then the second time through, you would change that and have it just be two times as long. And then the last, you might have it just be in the original measure time. Make sense? So then this would be actually, and then the, the polyphonic lines would be above that, okay? But the isorhythmic part of it is found here in the chant line, okay? Now we have some, we have some terms to know about this, and the first term to know is um, the talea, okay? So uh, here's a definition of it for you, but again, you don't have to write that down. It's on the slides. The talea, okay? The talea refers to a pattern of rhythms that repeats in the tenor, and the color refers to a pattern of pitches that repeats in the tenor. And this is where we stopped in the early morning section, so this is a review for the early morning section. So, um, the talea and the color. The talea refers to rhythmic patterns, the color refers to note patterns, okay? And uh, the composers who wrote isorhythmic motets were Philippe de Vitry, someone who we just met, also Guillaume de Marchot, Johannes Chiconia, and Guillaume de Failly. Okay. 
Um, now, if you would take out your anthologies, look at number 25. Or excuse me, yeah, number 25. Okay. Okay. We're listening to number 25, page 70. Uh, I guess it starts on page 71. Um, first off, let's just listen again. So you heard this this morning, uh, but just listen again. Tell me what you, tell me what it sounds like. Is there anything unexpected? What does polyphony at this time in history, right around 1360, sound like? Okay, here we go. Yeah, so what you're hearing here um, is called the Landini cadence, and it's also, it's a principle of when you go from a sixth to an octave, so a sixth in two voices which move outward to an octave. This was a very common way to do a cadence in the, at this time in the medieval period. Uh, it's called a Landini cadence, sometimes a double leading tone cadence, okay? Um, and it does sound very bizarre to us because it doesn't follow the, like, five, seven, one principle. This is all created through linear counterpoint, okay? So, in fact, and uh, I should point this out. Um, if you're writing a motet, right, what pro you're the composer. What process do you use? What do you start with? Chant line, right? Do you compose the chant line? No, obviously, you choose one. And then what do you do? Well, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spread it out. I'm going to repeat the chant line three times at 3x, 2x, and 1x. Okay? Then what do you do? Actually, there's evidence to say that composers wrote the entire motetus line from beginning to end next. Okay? You write the entire motetus line. And then you can write the entire contus or triplus line. Okay? So what have we done there? We've gone line by line. Right? So this is thinking in completely linear contrapuntal terms. Okay? So that is not in harmonic terms. Okay? We're not going from harmony to harmony in this case. All right? Um, what else? What else did you hear? Did you listen to it? Yeah, go ahead. So what's, what do we have in those bottom two lines? Which one is the tenor? Which one is the tenor line? The true tenor is the very bottom one, right? It's called tenor, right? What's that one just above it? So the, yeah, the contra tenor. Okay. The contratenor literally means against the tenor, and it's a way to add another voice without having to add another text. Okay, so not to get it too out there as far as complexity, but now we have this introduction of a new voice, a fourth voice, which moves along with the tenor line. Okay, and that is called the contratenor. All right. Um, so what's, what's the business with isorhythm in this case? In this case, if you look at, uh, if you look at the second page, and on page 72, second system from the bottom on the left, you see, at the, so you see underneath it says tenor A1. See where it says tenor A1? That's where the actual chant comes in and it says, Ate suspiramus, gementes, et flentes, etc. Okay, that's where the um, where the tenor actually comes in. Before that, it's called the introitus. It's called, it's the introduction, basically. Okay, and A one. That's a modern marking telling us where the color and the telea start. Remember, the color is a pattern of 
pitches and the tale is a pattern of rhythms. Okay, so A equals the color, one equals the tale. So let's look for one and then see if you can find a two. Top of page 73, and then can you find a three? 73, yeah. So if we were to compare the durations of each of those notes, we would find that it's the same pattern repeated a second time, okay? Um, the color, where's, where's B? If we have A as the first color, then where's B? Page 74, measure 149. So the color has lasted that entire time. What that means is that uh, the color and Talea only come back together in sync every 48 measures, I believe. Let's see. Uh, every 48 notes, okay? Because they're very slow moving notes. So we have these patterns within patterns that, uh, that are the foundation of these pieces. Does that make sense? Okay, so why am I pointing this out? First, because it was a major compositional technique of this time. Motets in the 14th century very often would have been isorhythmic. But beyond that, um, these motets allow for um, this this hidden order, right? Underneath all of this chaos of text and sound is a foundational mathematical order, okay? And that's the foundation upon which all of this is built, okay? All right. I need to talk to you about Michaud, all right? Guillaume de Michaud. Guillaume de Michaud lived 1300, around 1300 to 1377. Guillaume de Michaud is um, a very important French composer, all right? Uh, and not only is he a, an important French composer, he's also a very important poet. So if you took a poetry class of French medieval poetry, you would study Michaud as well, okay? Uh, Michaud is called the last Trovaire, okay? He's called the last Trovaire because he wrote some songs in the style of the Trovaires. And actually, before we get to this slide, I want to tell you about some of those songs, okay? So, um, I'm going to do that. If you would, please, turn the page uh, to 26, page 76 in your anthologies. Okay. So Michaud was one of those composers who wrote in every genre that was popular at the time, okay? Uh, this included motets, it included mass, uh, polyphonic mass ordinary items, but it also included the chanson, okay? The chanson of the, of the Trovers. So Guillaume de Michaud wrote in the typical forms. Now, over the course of 100 to 200 years, the Trovers uh, developed some pretty intricate forms, okay? Musical forms that they used in these chansons. Uh, and the, the ones that I want to tell you about are the virelay, the ballade, and the rondeau. Okay? The virelay, the ballade, and the rondeau. All right? Okay. The first one, let's, uh, let's look at the virelay. The virelay is number 26 in your book. We have three virelays here. And I'm just going to play this for you, all right? Here we go. Deuce Dama Jolie.
and then it goes back. Could you follow that? Could you follow that, more or less? Yeah. Uh, what we have are basically two different melodies, right? An A melody and a B melody. First melody and a second melody, okay? Um, and it kind of goes back and forth with uh, verse structure between those two. Um, now, when we talk about these forms, the virile, the ballade, and the rondeau, what we are talking about uh, are, and this is a term I want you to know, the form, which is in French, and fix. The form fix. The form fix simply means fixed forms, okay? Uh, and it's, it's these, okay? And if you were writing in a virile, you didn't have to choose what form that song would take. It was a preset form, okay? Uh, and the virile begins like this. Okay, it's A, B, B, A, A, all right? So the A, now let me just give you a quick instruction here. If it's a capital letter, that means that the text and the music is repeated. So in this section and this section, both the text and the music are repeated. But in, if it's lowercase, that means the text is not the same, only the melody is the same, okay? So if we have A, is the melody gonna be the same in this B section? No. Uh, is the melody gonna say, be the same between this B section and this B section? Yes. The melody is the same because it's B and B, but is the text going to be the same? The text is going to be different, right? So this A, is it going to be the same melody as this first A? Yeah. Yes, but is it going to be the same text? No. And this A, is it going to be the same melody as this first A? Mm -hmm. Yes, and the same text? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see what that, how that works? Okay. So um, let's listen to the next one, En Mon Cœur. Don't you think that's kind of nice, that, that piece we just heard? It's kind of pretty, right? Notice also that it's monophonic, right? The virile is, was very often a monophonic one, uh, okay? And what you find is that the virile can stretch out for more uh, more verses. You just keep this A, B, B, A, and then you B, B, A, B, B, A, B, B, A. Okay? Now, let's listen to the next one and see if we can follow along with this form in this second virile. Okay? Here we go. We'll stop it there. Okay? So, could you follow along with this form? Okay? This is really the key to listening to these form feeks. Um, while these forms are foreign to us, they would have been known by the listeners okay, of the day. And so you can expect this poetry to be, to be spun out in particular ways. Yes? So the B section is a 10 bar phrase. Mm -hmm. Is that normal? Or is they vary. Different? Yeah, they vary in length. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that the, the B was in a higher tessitura, though? More notes in a higher range? That is very common. You would have a lower A section and then a higher B section, and then okay. it goes down. Yeah. Other way, there were other also ways to distinguish between A and B sections as well, but that was a common one. Okay? All right. Uh, let's now move on to the next kind. So what do we have next? Next we have a rondeau. And there's no ballade in this, so let me tell you about the ballade uh, first. So the ballad is, again, very simple. Uh, we have an A, A, B, and then sometimes a chorus. By the way, um, I should say that if we have a capital letter, that means that it's a refrain, right, or a, what we might call a chorus. Because it's a return of both music and text, we could call it a refrain, right? So anytime you see that, it's basically uh, this is like a refrain, okay? And then here we have a refrain in the ballad where we have A, A, B, and then a refrain, and then it, it would go on. It might have three stanzas, okay? A, A, B, C, okay? And that might be the complete form. But you just need to 
remember this, okay? And then we have the rondeau. The rondeau is the most complex of these forms, um, and the rondeau goes like this. Um, well, yeah, the rondeau, the rondeau goes like this, A, B, A, 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 B, A, B. So A, B, lowercase a, uppercase a, A, B, A, B, all right? And I'm going to give you a, a shortcut way to remember this in just a moment. But let's see if we can follow along with this rondeau and see uh, if we can follow along with the form. So if we turn to number 27, page 80, this is a rondeau by Michaud called Rosalie's. Okay? And it sounds like this. Again, try to follow the form, okay? We were right, yes? And we could listen to the rest of this tracking what, what all's going on here, right? You notice that, you know, if you look at the score, it's like, really, if you look at the text in the score, 1 2, 6 7, 11 12, Rosa Lees, what does that mean? It means that that comes back here, here, and here, right? Okay, do you want me to tell you the easy way to remember all of these? Okay? All you have to do is remember. The basic form of the troubadours and trovers from the beginning was called the conso. And the conso consisted of three parts, A, A, B. Okay? This form, conso, is the core of every form piece. Okay? Um, so, for instance, let's look at the ballad, right? Can you see that it's basically a conso with a refrain added to it? Yeah. Right? Okay. But what about the virile? It's wrong, right? VBA? Well, the letters, what if we call this one B and this one uh, and this one A? Would you say that's equal, right? We just flip the letters. And what do we see here? There's our conso at the heart of this uh, virile, right? What about this one? Do you see the AAB in there? What if we bracket off all of the refrains? What are we left with? You see that? AAB, right? So these form feeks are simply. Um, different ways to deal with your, the uh, conso by adding refrains, okay? So just different ways to add refrains to a basic conso. Does this make sense? Yeah. I know it's a little complicated, but the whole purpose of learning this is to figure out how to listen to these, uh, these tracks, okay? All right. We need to switch gears again and now talk about... Oh, we are really going to switch gears. Have you noticed we've been talking a whole lot about um, uh, French composers? Yeah? We were in Notre Dame de Paris. We talked about Philippe de Vitry. We talked about Guillaume de Marchaud. Um, now, what in the world was going on in Italy in the 14th century? Well, everywhere in the world, People say the 14th century to mean 1300 to 1400, right? The Italians actually uh, have it a little bit more logical. For the 1300s, they say Trecento, okay? The 1300s. Uh, Trecento literally means 300, but instead of saying Mille Trecento uh, or Tre Mille Cento, it would, it's just Trecento, but that means the 1300s, okay, in Italy. And um, the Italian Trecento is 1300 to 1400. And here's the takeaway, all right? Here's the nugget. 
while France was taking a heavily intellectual, mathematical, musical approach to their limits, Italians were working more in a vernacular style, more of a popular style. Okay? Again, while France was taking the intellectual, mathematical, musical approaches to their limits, right, with the motet, uh, with the chanson, the form fixe, with the mass, Italians were a lot more down to earth. They were working in vernacular styles and popular styles. Okay? One example of this is the madrigal. Now, how many of you have sung madrigals in choirs? Okay, we're not talking about that madrigal. This is a madrigal that precedes the madrigals that you have uh, performed. Okay, this is what we will call the 14th century madrigal or the Trecento madrigal. Okay. Okay. So. Let us turn to number 31 in your anthologies, and we will listen to a piece by a guy named Jacopo da Bologna, okay? And actually, before I play this for you, I'm going to introduce uh, the other styles here. We'll talk about the madrigal, we'll talk about the caccia, and we'll talk briefly about the balata if we have time, okay? So the madrigal the caccia, and the balata. The madrigal um, is a two-voice vocal work. Uh, the caccia is, uh, refers to the hunt, so it's the, it comes from the Italian word to hunt. Okay? And then the balata refers to the dance. So I'm going to take this down here. And we'll listen to Jacopo da Bologna's um, madrigal Ostelecto. Here we go. Okay, we'll stop right there. So look at the text. Look at the text here. In France, what do we typically have for a secular tune, the subject of? Love, right? Yeah, fan amour. Okay, what's this about? A wild bird during the season sings sweet lines in a fine style. I do not praise a singer who shouts loudly. Loud shouting does not make good singing, but with smooth and sweet melody. Lovely singing is produced, and this requires skill. Few people possess it, but all set up as masters and compose balate, madrigals, and motets. All try to outdo Philippe de Vitry and Marchetto of Padua. Thus the country is so, full, is so full of petty masters that there is no room left for pupils. Well, what's this about? It's about singing, and it's meant to be humorous, right? It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be a little bit irreverent, okay? Not something you would necessarily find in a Frenchman's composition, okay? Uh, so this is the madrigal. The madrigal is marked by... Uh, two vocal lines in Italian and it has contrapuntal uh, relationships but I want to play the next one for you the next one is a setting of the same text Okay, a setting of the same text but in a different genre the genre of the caccia okay? so tell me the caccia refers to the hunt right? what is hunt like about this setting. What is Hunt like about this setting? Okay, what did you notice that was Hunt like about this? Well, the other. One line chases the other, yeah. Did you notice that? Uh, the first line comes out and then the second line imitates that first line, okay? The kacha also refers to the French word for Hunt is chasse, which looks like chase. So chase, hunt, kacha, uh, all of these refer to like the chase. Yeah? So it's just saying that the same 
kind of funny that he's taking this text that's kind of saying there's not any room left for masters, there's all these petty people trying to imitate, but he's taking that and putting it in all these different styles, and maybe he's just kind of like poking fun at all these people, like making a mockery of them trying to be um, the petty masters. Absolutely. This is supposed to be funny. This is supposed to be funny, and it's supposed to, you know, this rapid text uh, in Italian, it's supposed to be kind of tumbling forth, and you think if, uh, if you're less than a master at singing, you're going to be able to sing these fast lines. So if you're not a great singer and you sing this, you kind of make a fool of yourself, right? So yeah, I mean, he's, the Italians were a lot... Uh, a lot more into like slapstick humor, a lot more into uh, overt humor, you know, crude humor, um, as we will see throughout the rest of the year. Um, okay, so the Trecento um, is, yeah, okay, let's end with a ballata. Okay, let's end with a ballata. Uh, with the Italian Trecento songs, this is what I want you to remember. Italian Trecento, how does it compare to the French uh, kind of motet intellectual style at this time? Can you remind me? What's the main takeaway about the Italian Trecento? Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so the French had this highly intellectual mathematical style, right? The Italian Trecento is very different from that. It's more down to earth, more popular in style. It's funnier. Like French, the French music, you don't often find yourself chuckling when you listen to this French music, you know? Uh, instead, but when you do listen to the Italian music, it's, it can be quite funny. Um, Okay, so let's listen to the Ballata by Landini. Okay, this is number 32 in your book. Here we go. We'll stop it right there. Um, so you may notice that in this particular piece, it's much closer to the French style, okay? We have more voices. It sounds more uh, intellectually high, right? And the ballata does share some characteristics with the ballad uh, of the form beaks, okay? Um, so, again, to review, if we were to compare in the 14th century the French versus the Italians, you might have a good way to distinguish them, at least in broad strokes, right? Okay? The French style is... Um, represented by the motet, very high sort of intellectual style. The Italian style is far more low, uh, popular style. Now, this uh, carries over into the 15th century, and when I see you all next time on Friday, we will talk about Guillaume du Fay's Nuper Rosarum Flores. And this piece represents the apex of this high intellectual mathematical symbolism so I want you to reread the uh, anthology essay on Nuper Rosarum Flores to try and understand what the mathematical symbolism is there, because when we come back on Friday, we'll talk about Ar Subtilior, which is the end of the medieval period, and we'll start about talk about the beginning of the Renaissance period by discussing Nuper Rosarum Flores. All right. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>